So, on Tuesday night, I drove through a literal winter storm to go see the midnight premiere of the Mario movie. It took me over 10 minutes and the help of my mom, thanks mom, just to get out of my street. So as I drove to the theater, all I could think was, this had better be the best movie I've ever seen. And, well, it wasn't that. But it was still a lot of fun. Before I go any further, keep in mind, spoilers will follow. Yeah, I actually did quite enjoy this movie. Granted, I'm a pretty huge Mario fan. I think if you're like me and you've played a lot of Mario games, you will derive a lot of enjoyment from this movie. I know deep down that this isn't great writing, but I was honestly more amused by the references in this movie than I was by the actual jokes. Still, it just feels like a love letter in many ways to fans of the series. And fellas, the score to this movie, oh my gosh, when are they releasing that? I've gotta have that now. That said, the needle drops felt so extremely bizarre and out of place. Like, in terms of motif, I understand the placement of No Sleep Till Brooklyn or I Need a Hero. Side note, can't wait to see what Schaeferlis has to say about that. But it just feels so weird to see classic characters such as the Mario cast over a backdrop of Take On Me. That genuinely feels like a meme. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the issues pointed out to me by the girl I saw the movie with. She said the movie failed because neither Toadette nor Daisy was in it, and they're the best characters in the Mario canon. She also mentioned that the movie felt surprisingly short. The film is only 93 minutes, which, compared to the standard blockbuster today, that is indeed short. But in my mind, a story should trim all the fat rather than waste the audience's time with artificial plot lengtheners, which is what too many big-budget movies do these days. Beyond that, much to my surprise, the voice acting didn't take me out of it. I thought everyone did a good job. In my mind, the movie just got better the longer it went on. But that's not what you're here for. Or maybe it is. I don't know your life. I assume you're here for writing advice. Believe it or not, despite how simple this plot is, there's a lot we can learn from it, particularly in the way of adaptation. Not to be that guy, but Merriam-Webster defines adaptation simply as a composition written into a new form. I think that's a great definition. A lot of definitions of adaptation are too constraining, saying that an adaptation can only be one form of writing to another. But that's not true. In theory, anything can be adapted from one medium to another. The Super Mario Bros. movie is, interestingly, a pretty excellent model for how we would adapt something, particularly something with so minimal source material. This should come as a shock to no one, but video games have always been a hard medium to adapt to film. There are a few reasons for that. While there are many video games that are highly cinematic, the one thing that separates video games from movies is the viewer's agency. In a video game, the player moves the plot forward. Even in a video game where the plot won't change on replay, unlocking character beats and progressing the story feels rewarding because the player causes those things to happen through their learned skill. In a movie, the viewer is just along for the ride. This isn't to say that either of these forms of storytelling is inherently wrong or bad. No, quite the contrary. Video games can be some of the most effective storytelling works out there. But the choice to turn a story into a movie or a video game is a very deliberate choice. And suddenly flipping the medium is rarely going to work out. Think about it in reverse. How many truly amazing video games can you list that are based on movies? There are certainly great games based on properties like Marvel, DC, and Star Wars. But games based on actual movies? that attempt to follow the movie plot beat for beat, it just doesn't really work out. And so, if you want to adapt a video game to film, there are, in my opinion, some pretty fundamental changes that need to take place. Look at Detective Pikachu or the Sonic movies. As a Pokemon fan myself, I don't think any fan of the franchise would say they play the games for the story. So when it came time to make a live-action Pokemon movie, Nintendo was very wise to base the movie on a spin-off, a more story-driven game, and even then, a lot of creative liberties were taken with the plot. As for Sonic, while the Hedgehog's games do often have a more cinematic story, they tend to be... Shadow! It's you? Zavok! Metal! Chaos! Psychomantis! Just all over the place. Again, Sega was wise to craft an original story for Sonic, one that was more character-driven. Part of why these movies succeed is because they remind the audience of the original games without making a viewer just wish they were playing the games instead. They stand alone as their own unique media experience. They might make a person want to go back and revisit old titles, but for the right reasons. They're not cheap substitutes for the games, but independent creative works. And speaking of story in Nintendo games, this leads us to a famous, or rather infamous, quote from Shigeru Miyamoto himself, the creator of Mario. 
If you're familiar with Nintendo games at all, you're probably well aware that story is not a priority. You boot up the original Legend of Zelda, and you get this single screen with an explanation and objective, then you're popped into the game, and that's it. You just go from there. Who's Link? How did he get involved in all this? Where is he? Where does he go? It's dangerous to go alone. Take this. In Super Smash Bros, why and how are all these fighters together in the same space? Who cares, just do a big punch. You might chalk this all up to console limitations of the time. I mean, how much story can you tell on an NES? But even as Nintendo released more sophisticated hardware, story still always took a backseat to gameplay, which is why the official Zelda timeline looks like this. And again, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's good that we have Majora's Mask and Wind Waker, even if those stories could never exist in the same in-game universe. But it presents a real challenge when it comes time to adapt. Just to make sure I'm not misleading anyone here, I do want to read what Miyamoto shared with IGN. These are quotes from him in February 2023 and February 2017. He said, First of all, it's not that complex stories are unnecessary. That's not what I'm saying at all. Story is one way of explaining a game. For example, when there's an interactive game, the experience for everyone is different. One of the most enjoyable things about a PC or a computer is that it provides the same thing to everybody. That interesting aspect is something you have to keep pulling out as you keep playing and keep playing and keep playing. I think story is just another way to pull out enjoyment from this experience. Another way to focus on that enjoyment is to focus on a gameplay experience that gets you to try things over and over again. As I mentioned, story is one way to explain the game, and when that goes well, sometimes people take the route when creating their next game of starting with the story. For me, the starting story is how to make the gameplay fun, and that's how I begin thinking about and creating a game. While it's important that a story lingers in a player's mind, their own experience in that game is what the story is. Now, this statement is controversial for many reasons when looking at Miyamoto's history. YouTuber Arlo just made a great video about this, pointing out that the Paper Mario franchise has suffered in a lot of ways from the gameplay-first mentality. To paraphrase Arlo, a gameplay-first mentality doesn't always mean story second, but sometimes just means no story at all. And again, this is acceptable in many ways for a medium such as games, but it certainly presents a challenge when it comes time to adapt, so let's get into how we would go about that. Since Mario is a character who's not so much defined by story, the first step would be to take a look at the things he is defined by. Ultimately, when we begin writing the story, we probably won't include all the elements we initially thought of, but they'll serve as a great basis. Two movies that do this quite well are Clue and Pirates of the Caribbean. Both of these movies have a pretty flimsy source, but both include the necessary iconography from their respective starting grounds. I like Clue in particular for this example. We know the board game has six iconic weapons and various rooms. Rather than choosing one murder weapon and one room, there are six murders in the movie. It's kind of perfect. The movie also has a few different endings, calling back to the fact that the board game can end in any number of ways. While 1985 Super Mario Bros. is not the game to first feature Mario, it is, in my opinion, the game that first defined him. So, in the lens of that game, what is it that defines Mario? Well, he's an Italian plumber who travels through pipes. He has a brother named Luigi. Even though there's not much story, there is a premise. Mario has to save the Princess Toadstool from the evil Bowser. He accomplishes this task by traversing the Mushroom Kingdom. He goes on land, through water, over various platforms, and through castles. Along the way, he collects power-ups such as mushrooms, fire flowers, and stars. He fights enemies such as Goombas, Koopas, Piranha Plants, etc. While it might not seem like much, that is genuinely a great place to start. With the basics out of the way, what more is there to say about Mario? Well, over the years, he's collected other power-ups too, like the Tanuki Suit, Mini Mushrooms, Ice Flower, Cat Suit, and others. He drives carts. He hangs out with Donkey Kong sometimes. They're rivals of sorts. Oh, and Mario's gone through lots of other worlds too. Deserts, forests, mountains. Over the years, Mario has remained a very serious character in his objectives, but provides comic relief by often being the butt of the joke. Bowser has taken on more personality too, generally menacing, but often comical as well. That's all great, but it doesn't necessarily bring us closer to any story. If you have a premise but don't know where to go for a story, there is one thing that I suggest every single time. The Hero's Journey. If you took ninth grade English, you're probably familiar with The Hero's Journey. It's pretty amusing when people will point out how one story is the same as another and then just list the steps of The Hero's Journey. 
Or, if you keep a pretty heavy online presence like me, you might recall that Dan Harmon is a huge believer in the hero's journey, or the story circle as he calls it. Better yet, before we do that, let's ask ourselves, what is a story? The uh, so-called story circle is my attempt to remove all of the hard and repeated work from the task of breaking a story. Indeed, the hero's journey has undergone a great deal of change since Joseph Campbell first wrote about it in The Hero with a Thousand Faces. If you're curious, this is my preferred version of the hero's journey, but even here the hero doesn't always need to refuse the call. Moreover, some of these steps can be done out of order. I'll show you what I mean through the lens of the Mario movie. Stasis. This is the hero's world as they know it. In the source material, Mario's stasis pretty much always includes Luigi, and that's not different here. But from there, the writers had a choice to make. I would never have made Mario a fish-out-of-water character. Since the 1995 game Yoshi's Island, Mario was depicted as having been born in the Mushroom Kingdom along with the rest of his family. We've already seen what could happen in a Mario movie if you do a fish-out-of-water story. But just because it's not the choice I would have made doesn't mean it's an inherently wrong choice. It just means that choice is going to need some justification. So, the stasis chosen for Mario and Luigi is two plumbers from Brooklyn, hearkening back to the old Super Mario Bros. Super Show. The two live with their family members who are highly critical of the duo. Mario is depicted as someone who's constantly knocked down and frustrated because of it, but he reasons that as long as he has Luigi, he'll be fine. Mario and Luigi then cross a threshold, entering the Mushroom Kingdom, leaving the ordinary world, and crossing over into the special world. The call to adventure then comes at this same time, when Luigi and Mario are separated. Mario knows he needs to save his brother. This has the classic makings of a hero's journey. You take everything that a hero is and start stripping it from them to see how they cope. Mario soon meets his mentor, Princess Peach, and faces tests, allies, and enemies. He meets Toad, faces Donkey Kong, drives a cart on Rainbow Road where he's ambushed, until he and Donkey Kong fall into the ocean and are swallowed by an eel. At this moment, Mario is literally brought to his lowest point, both in terms of altitude and emotion. He has to grapple with the fact that he may never save Luigi, and that his father was right. Mario's actions dragged Luigi down and doomed him. Mario and DK eventually escape the eel and approach the inmost cave. They go to face Bowser and save Peach, Luigi, Cranky, Toad, and the whole Mushroom Kingdom. It doesn't entirely go as planned, as suddenly everyone returns to the ordinary world. This is where Mario faces the ordeal in the abyss and his shadow self. In one sense, Bowser is Mario's shadow self. Throughout the entire movie, Mario has always been willing to get back up. But suddenly, when confronted with Bowser, he starts to question whether he really should get back up. The story has brought Mario to his lowest point. Moreover, on the idea of the shadow self, there's one line from Bowser that fascinated me when I first heard it. Bowser blames Mario for Peach's rejection of him. He says, I was finally going to be happy. Mario and Bowser are similar in this sense. They are banking their happiness on outward circumstances. Once the world stops beating Mario down, then he will be happy. Once Princess Peach marries Bowser, then he will be happy. Both Bowser and Mario are unable to appreciate what they have. It's only when Mario sees the commercial he made with his brother that he gains the confidence to get back up again. He remembers that as long as he has Luigi, he'll be fine. This is where Mario's apotheosis as a character occurs. He is proven right when he's nearly killed by Bowser's fire, but Luigi shields him with a manhole cover and saves him. As such, Mario and Luigi find the ultimate boon together, the power of the superstar, and their friendship with Peach, Toad, and Donkey Kong. Mario and Luigi have now become the masters of two worlds and have ascended to a higher plane through their arcs. As you can see, it doesn't follow the hero's journey to a T, but it hits the most important parts, the parts that truly test Mario as a hero and make him grow as a character. Speaking of character, Mario's not the only one who grows as a character in this story. It's subtle, but we can see Donkey Kong grow as well. He starts as a showboat trying to win his father's favor, but when he saves his father, he forgoes the chance to showboat. He's learned what's important. Being a hero does not mean gaining the approval of others. Luigi likewise has an arc. It's classic Luigi business. He starts afraid, but like Mario, he realizes what's important and knows he can't let his fear overcome what matters in life. I would have liked it if Peach had gone on more of a character journey, but at the least, I was extremely glad she was an active participant in the story, making choices and pushing the plot forward along with Mario. Many have accused the film's plot of being thin, and I mean, yeah. 
The basic Mario formula wasn't altered too much for the movie, even if Luigi is more the damsel in distress in this version. And well, in my opinion, there's only so much you can do with a damsel in distress story. It doesn't mean the story's bad necessarily, formulas don't always have to be bad. I mean, the hero's journey is a formula. The main takeaway you should have from this video is how to adapt, and that formula goes like this. Identify essential elements, then look to the hero's journey. That doesn't mean you'll get it right the first time. Revision is always a must. But this is a great story writing exercise to try to test your plotting abilities. I know that when I'm experiencing writer's block in my narratives, I always go back to the hero's journey, and it almost always puts me right back on track. So, why don't we give this a try? Let's say I was tasked with writing a movie about a very thinly plotted character. Let's put what the Mario movie teaches us to the test. I encourage you to do this too. Pick a character, however minor, and pitch your movie in the comments. I'd love to see what you come up with. To stay on theme, let's pick another video game character. When it comes to plot and backstory, Mario is probably the vaguest character in Nintendo's catalog. Kirby, while also mostly having games with gameplay over story, has been fleshed out a lot more over the years, in large part thanks to the show Kirby Right Back At Ya. I'll try to draw only from the game specifically, both for the challenge and to maintain a spirit true to the games, like the Mario movie maintains. Step 1. Analyze the things that define Kirby as a character. Kirby is a cute little guy who lives in Dreamland. He seems to be the only one of his kind. He loves to sleep and eat, sometimes to a fault. The unofficial monarch of Dreamland, King DDD, acts as an enemy to Kirby, but eventually becomes his friend. This is similarly the case for the character of Meta Knight, a rival and infrequent enemy to Kirby. He mostly serves as an ally, but sometimes his good intentions put him in opposition with the pink hero. When Kirby inhales an enemy, he can gain their power. Kirby can also levitate for what seems to be an indefinite amount of time. To learn about the more nitty-gritty pieces of Kirby, I watched these videos from YouTuber the RPG Monger. Thanks, RPG Monger. The Kirby lore is shockingly deep, and I would not have understood it at all without these videos. Step 2. The Hero's Journey If you're a Kirby fan, you'll likely notice some heavy borrowing from Kirby games, but obviously that's the idea with adaptation. Let me know what you think of my proposed Kirby movie. Stasis. Kirby lives on the continent of Dreamland on the planet Popstar. He turned up seemingly out of nowhere a short time ago, and while the residents find him bizarre and his positive disposition annoying, they let him stick around. Call to Adventure King DDD takes all the food in Dreamland. The citizens feel hopeless, but Kirby, being the upbeat soul that he is, goes to retrieve it all. He does so pretty efficiently. DDD, feeling annoyed that his power grab failed, goes to the Fountain of Dreams, where he breaks the Star Rod, scattering its pieces across Dreamland, leaving everything in darkness. Refusal of the Call from Kirby, there is none, but the citizens are once again hopeless, doubting anything can be done. Kirby once again seeks to change their minds. Meeting the Mentor When Kirby says he'll retrieve the Star Rod pieces, the swordsman Meta Knight immediately doubts Kirby's ability and puts him to the test. The two spar, and Meta Knight wins, beating Kirby pretty badly and attempting to drain him of hope. Meta Knight says he'll collect the Star Rod pieces and fix Dreamland on his own. With that, he takes the Halberd and leaves crossing the threshold. But you can't keep a good Kirby down. Kirby leaves his hometown to go get the pieces of the Star Rod. At the same time, this causes the citizens of Dreamland to cross a mental threshold. They're inspired by Kirby's hope, and start standing up to DDD's forces. Tests, Allies, and Enemies Kirby fights many enemies that DDD has entrusted with the Star Rod pieces. He gains the allyship of a Waddle Dee wearing a bandana and wielding a spear. Kirby finds the Warp Star, which aids him in traveling across the land. He flies to Meta Knight's ship. Meta Knight has half the Star Rod pieces. They fight again, and this time Kirby wins, gaining Meta Knight's favor. Approach the Inmost Cave. Kirby and his new friends arrive at the Fountain of Dreams, where DDD stands waiting. The Ordeal in the Abyss. It's a three-on-one, but DDD is much more prepared this time. He beats Waddle Dee and Meta Knight and pushes Kirby to the ledge of the fountain. Kirby chooses to fall, surprising DDD, but he floats back around, inhales DDD, and takes the final piece of the star rod that he was holding. The day seemingly won. Apotheosis. Thanks to Kirby's persistence, he can now put the star rod back together. But DDD warns Kirby, explaining that when he tried to take the star rod from the fountain, he felt great evil stirring, so he had to break it to keep the evil at bay. Meta Knight thinks DDD is lying. The ultimate boon. Kirby, trusting as ever, believes DDD and pats him on the back. 
Meta Knight then forcefully takes the Star Rod pieces and reassembles them, releasing the evil. Kirby fights and defeats the Dark Matter using the Warp Star and Star Rod. Refusal of the return. DDD and Meta Knight both feel ashamed about returning after all the trouble they've caused, but Kirby comforts them both and encourages them to come home. The road back home. They all fly back on Meta Knight's ship. Master of Two Worlds. Kirby is now friends with a reformed DDD, Meta Knight, and all the people of Dreamland. The citizens of Dreamland manage to forgive as well, following Kirby's example. Return with special knowledge. Kirby hasn't changed much at all. He knew the lesson from the start. But thanks to him, everyone else has gained special knowledge of positivity, forgiveness, and reformation. Everyone can feel hope again in Dreamland. There's my pitch. As I said, I hope you guys follow this exercise too, just for fun and practice, or if you're stuck on a current story you're writing, this exercise ought to work for that just as well. Good information is the key to good inspiration. Review what you know about your characters, and where they are in their hero's journey. All in all, I really did like the Mario movie. I'm glad we can live in an era where the video game movie curse has all but vanished. Hopefully. As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the movie, as well as the writing advice I've given here. Tell me everything. And keep in mind, ultimately, this is a rough draft.